Thank you, Andy. Um, I'd like to start by uh, thanking IDS uh, for hosting our uh, D Group's annual partners meeting yesterday, and thanks to all those from D Group's partners who are still here for this conference for attending that meeting. Um, James um, mentioned about IDS and D Groups. And I'll just say a few words about D-Groups. D-Groups is a growing collaboration of uh, development organisations working for promoting communication for international development and social justice and health and so on. And we've been going for about 15 years and we um, have, thanks to WA Research, uh, a company in Switzerland which has been providing the platform and Damir and uh, Joe are here today as well. And for more information about D-Groups and to join the D-Groups partnership, uh, please go to dgroups.info. I'm currently the chair of the board. Uh, I also run uh, some large communities of practice and have been doing this since going back to about 1998-99. So I've seen D-Groups uh, and Elders come, come through, and I've been running, in particular, some large communities of practice called HIFA, which stands for Healthcare Information for All, for the last uh, 10 years. And these, these communities now have more than 15,000 members in uh, 175 countries, uh, interacting in, in three different languages, and continuing to expand. So I believe in, in responding to, to uh, um, Jeff's question about should we be packing up and going to the bar, I think we want to be investing our time and effort into building, we want to include communities of practice in this because I think communities of practice have a specially exciting future. We were asked to uh, identify and talk about three trends. And we're not sure whether we, uh, we came together with Ivan and with Adrian um, to look at this. So this is a personal view, and we're very much wanting to just open up a discussion. But what we are hoping to see, and what we think is really important, and what we feel there are some signs of, is that communities of practice are bringing with them a whole sense of increasing inclusiveness, a whole sense of increasing value, and increasing collaboration. And we're just going to say a few words about each of those things and then wrap up. Okay. Before, well, I think this audience is familiar with the term communities of practice. So a broad definition is a community of practice is a group of people who share a concern or a passion for something they do and learn how to do it better as they interact uh, regularly. And that's from the Etienne Wenger uh, website. And that, under, in, the, in the next sentence, he says, so in fact, even a street gang is a community of practice because they're people that share knowledge on how to respond to a hostile environment. So it can be thought of as very broad, but we're going to look at it, particularly in the international development sphere. So we're looking here at virtual communities of practice, in other words, communities of practice that interact uh, through the internet, with a focus on international development, health and social justice. Some of these communities of practice, and there were literally thousands, uh, work towards an agreed shared vision, and that is, uh, Hif the HIFA communities are an example of that. So those may be termed communities of purpose, so a community of purpose is a sort of subtype of a community of practice. For the purpose of our presentation, we're not going to talk about project teams doing defined pieces of work. And we're not going to talk either about communities of practice that are closed to certain groups of people. Um, one, of the, one of the exciting things about communities of practice, as we'll say, is their openness for anybody to be able to join um, with a, uh, if they have a, an interest in the, the subject matter. And we're going to be, so we're looking especially at transparent and virtual communities of practice that are open to anyone. We, our small group, feel that 
communities of practice are and will be transformational. They transcend organisations, geographical location and professional status. Some examples here of communities of practice, knowledge management for development, came for Dev, IFRA I've mentioned, Pelican, and there are many, many more. These are examples of D-Groups, which has 700 communities of practice, but there are of course many others, both in the non-commercial and especially predominantly in the commercial environment, such as Google Groups and so on. Why are they important? I think we only need to look at the very first few sentences of the Strategic Development Goals Agenda to, sh to see that the success of the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals is fundamentally dependent on our ability to work all together, all, all countries, all stakeholders, acting in collaborative partnership. And I believe that communities of practice bring a really important uh, uh, contribution to this. So these trends, are, are these trends that we're talking about or are these wishful thinking? We'll have time to discuss that shortly. We first uh, will talk about increasing inclusiveness and I hand over to Ivan. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's a real good book. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, well, as, as Neil said, this is somehow bordering between evangelical research hypothesis and some sort of trends that we globally recognize. Um, let us start with inclusiveness. If we look at the global trends, then there are indeed some trends which are um, recognized globally, such as increased connectivity and increased mobile phone ownership. Um, there is also increased social interaction, so a lot of the connectivity includes the social component. Think Facebook, think LinkedIn. And there is also political commitment to, inclusive, to, include, to increase inclusiveness. Okay, so if we look more on wishful thinking side, then there are a few things that we hope can happen. Uh, more and more people will be able to participate in COPs, and there will be increased knowledge co-production, knowledge sharing, etc. Now, this is mainly if we look at simple numbers. Okay, so I'm not. We will talk about challenges, and we will see that uh, participation and, and just sheer numbers do not guarantee inclusiveness. But if we look just from potential of participating and the sheer numbers, we indeed see a possibility that more and more people will participate in COPs and we hope that there might be more joint production and knowledge sharing. There is also a possibility of uh, hearing the voices that are not heard. So we talked a lot about local, local knowledge this morning and uh, local knowledge has the component of indeed being heard but it also has the component of specific local language and we hope that increased sophistication of machine translation might improve this uh, participation of unheard voices so far. If we look at the challenges though, we see that access does not mean inclusiveness and obviously this is quite intuitive. In addition to this, there are some very specific barriers. There are psychological barriers to participate in an online community of practice. Uh, sharing something publicly, so Neil said that obviously communities of actors transcend cultures, transcend organizations, transcend continents. That is true, but at the same time it is very difficult sometimes to openly share a question or openly share a challenge uh, in front of the people that you do not know. So there are many psychological barriers. Uh, in addition to this, there is, let's say, more of a political economy component where we see that the social can be very positive, but if we look at, uh, if we look at certain states and certain governments, they also treat social as very, um, well, revolutionary and they try to block it and oppose it. In addition, there is if there are, if there is already a psychological barrier in participating in community practice, it is even more difficult to express sometimes political views. And finally in terms of some specific barriers, yes machine translation, but communities of practice today are mainly in English. Um, and the technical barriers will remain. The technology changes quickly. The technology changes in a way that in, 
improves access in principle, but still people need capacity building to be able to participate freely and quickly. So what is our call for action here? We would like to support COPs towards greater inclusiveness, and we would like to enable all global citizens to contribute to international development. And all the jargon words that you have there that we all relate to, such as social justice, uh, regardless of professional status or education level. Then we go to the value. And in terms of how we separate and how we think about value, we layer it on, on, on three uh, levels. We have value to participants of communities of practice, value to the organizations, and also value in terms of global partnerships. And here specifically we focus on global, uh, on um, sustainable development goal 17, which is indeed uh, related to partnerships and working together. We, uh, we talk a lot about m and &E and how difficult it is indeed to gather evidence and how difficult it is to go beyond numbers. We do believe that the thinking is advancing, it is still very difficult, but the thinking is getting a little bit more sophisticated. Now, what are the opportunities? In terms of participants, uh, we do hope that participants will be able, will be able, by participating and through participating in communities of practice, to enhance their personal learning. We also believe that the whole aspect of social learning will, will increase uh, in communities of practice. In addition to this, there is, a, there is a very important drive, which is very personal, uh, that people can get uh, good exposure if they participate in community practice, so they can profile themselves. It sounds a little bit egoistic, but I think it's a very valuable um, possibility in community practice. What are the potential, what is the opportunity and the value for organizations? First, the tacit knowledge. Uh, we have a slide about explicit knowledge and codified knowledge, and there is a lot of talk about uh, how difficult it is, or even impossible if you read actual Polanyi to capture tacit knowledge. Uh, and in addition to this, the communities of practice could allow organizations, again, to profile themselves, to profile themselves as a producer of specific knowledge products, for example. In terms of uh, contribution to global partnerships, the communities of practice could catalyze multidisciplinary cooperation. So we are talking about indeed breaking down the silos. And uh, they could also be tool to inform policy making. But what are the challenges? Well, for the participants, and I think we can all relate to this, there is lack of time. Lack of time because your manager says you need to deliver something uh, relatively quickly. Um, it is also difficult sometimes to find relevant community practice. We talked about atomization, and we will touch upon that a, a, a later. Uh, how do you find indeed the most valuable community, the most relevant community? For organizations, uh, we believe that communities of practice are often left in a little bit of capacity vacuum. So there is often a desire to set up a community of practice. It is often driven just by the fact that there is a certain group of people that works together. But communities of practice need to be managed and facilitated. And this capacity aspect is often forgotten and marginalized. In addition to this, you have certain organizations that are very hierarchical. And community of practice, indeed, as Neil said, are, are quite horizontal. They go beyond teams, and sometimes they also involve external partners. For an organization, such openness and uh, cross-cutting aspect can be threatening. In terms of global partnerships, it's indeed a fragmented ecosystem. It's indeed the issue of uh, atomization. And we also believe that there is lack of research uh, around the impact of communities of practice. So what we would like to see we would like to see uh, action on two levels. We would like to see communities of practice managers to gather evidence of members' needs. And again, it comes to the point, oh, let's launch a community. Why? Why do you want to launch a community? We want uh, managers to be very explicit about the purpose and edit value of each community. And we would like very much to see more online uh, community management courses and material. Uh, we would like to support also communities of practice through research on community of practice impact and indeed providing courses on online top management. Thank you. I hand back to you.
Great, many thanks, Ivan. So, thirdly, we're talking about the trend that we feel that is happening with regards to increasing collaboration. And we see this as happening within communities of practice, among communities of practice, and also that it's supported by a growing global culture of collaboration, um, as, as uh, exemplified by the, the kinds of policy statements that are coming out at high level. Collaboration within communities of practice goes beyond simply finding new partners as a result of being members of communities of practice, even though that is important. So you can find collaborations with other organisations, but this is, we're also talking here about the, the collaborative spirit of a community of practice, which is typified in, a, in any community of practice, but perhaps especially in a community of purpose, where the participants have agreed a, a, a goal or a vision that they're working towards. So, so we see communities of practice as a really exciting new phenomenon in the world. I say new because they've really only been around for about 15 years and they've only recently started to be really accessible technically to a majority of the world's population. A long way to go, but they are a huge, they do have such a huge potential. I believe, personally, and I think that my co-speakers uh, agree that one of the biggest problems is the nature of the communities of practice ecosystem. In other words, the global totality of all these communities of practice that are springing up all over the place, a little bit like the portal um, uh, proliferation that was talked about earlier, that is happening also with, in communities of practice. What we'd really like to be able to see is for a much more transparent look, a visual map, if you like, of the communities of practice in international development, so that people can find the communities that they're looking for, and also so that individual communities of practice can more easily reach out to and interconnect with other communities of practice. Because I believe that the strength of communities of practice for the next 10, 20 years will be largely determined by the ability of communities of practice to actually work collectively in terms of not, not uh, being coordinated in any way, but to be more interconnected. And another aspect of communities of practice is their inclusiveness, which means that they generally will, in, will welcome people from all of the se sectors uh, of society, from public sector, private sector, civil society, and other, other sectors. So our call for action with communities of practice is for, for organizations and funders to embrace the potential of communities of practice and provide an enabling environment for them to reach their full potential. So then in conclusion, we have we, we suggest three trends, increasing inclusiveness, increasing value, increasing collaboration. You may or may, you may not agree. Uh, we look forward to your, to your comments on this. We certainly need better ways of measuring these kinds of, of things. But I think you'll agree that they resonate also with, the, uh, with several of the preceding uh, discussions about values and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you.